Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Hope Church. So glad you're here this morning. If we've never met, my name's Jeff, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff. We're so glad that you're here this morning as we get to worship together in this Advent season as we make our way towards Christmas. Uh, as you walked in, you should have received a bulletin. If you're uh, watching us online, if you're joining us online this morning, you can also find the information in the Hope Church app. And so when you came in, you should have got that communication card. Tear that communication card off. Fill it out. Here's the competition. I'm, I'm going to give you a little competition this week, okay? Here's your little here's your little challenge. I want the best limerick to Pastor Mark, okay? The best limerick. You need to look up what a limerick is, maybe because some of you haven't been in English for a few years, but um, the point is, fill out that communication card. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear how we can pray for you this Christmas season as well. Uh, fill that out. Drop it in the bucket on your way out. If you do have the Hope Church app, you can do all of that on the Hope Church app as well. And so we'd love to hear from you this week. Speaking of this week, Christmas Eve is coming very, very soon. I don't know if you've checked your calendar lately and you've got all your packages wrapped and all those things, but Christmas Eve is coming. We are going to be celebrating all together over in the Family Life Center here at Main Campus at 3, 5, and 7 on Christmas Eve. And maybe the thing to think about is not necessarily what service you're coming to, although that would be smart, is who are you bringing with you, right? So whether it's family or friends, who needs to hear the hope of Jesus? Uh, and his coming. Again, uh, main campus 3, 5, and 7 over in the Family Life Center. Uh, North Campus is also hosting Christmas Eve services at 5 and 7 up at North Campus again on Christmas Eve, and we can't wait to celebrate together. It's one of our favorite seasons and our favorite services of the year, and so we look forward to gathering together again 3, 5, and 7 on Christmas Eve. It is a different time here in the office, and so you have uh, in your bulletins noted uh, the different office times, uh, when the office will be open, when It'll be closed throughout the next couple weeks. This week, specifically on December 24th, will be open till noon, and then we're getting ready for our Christmas Eve services the rest of the day. So again, if you have any business to take care of in the office, contact any of the office folks. Make sure you check the office times, the adjusted office times that are in your bulletins so we can get in communication with you. This morning, we're going to continue in our series, Simple, Simple Christmas, and we're so excited to talk about joy this morning. I don't know about you, but I would need to talk about joy. I need to be reminded about joy this morning, and so we're excited to do that. We're going to sing together, so why don't you get on your feet and let's worship together this morning.
praise this morning. It is so good to be together. It is so good to be able to worship him and to glorify him. We have a joy that stands apart from the rest of the world. We have a joy because we know a Savior who came and who loves us and who died for us. He died in our place, and we have a joy in our hearts because we know what the future holds. We know where we get to go when our time on this earth is over. The fact is, we have a God who loves us so much that he sent his only son. He gave us a Savior. He gave us a Redeemer, and we get to glorify him because of that. thinking this week about uh, the life of Jesus, and I was thinking about how much we have written about him in our Bibles. We have his birth, and we have the Magi coming, the wise men coming and visiting, and then we have the beginning of his ministry, but there's a whole almost 30-some years that are missing from Scripture about who Jesus is and how he grew up. Those are kind of like the silent years for us of Jesus' life. It was just Mary 
her family, and the God-man. And where the Bible is silent, which is most of 30 years of his life on earth, Mary, his mom, had memories and stories of his growing up. She had to wrestle with the realities that we can't even fathom. Because in that stable 2,000 years ago, Mary held a seemingly helpless baby in her arms. And he was a baby that looked just like any other baby. And if it weren't for the shepherds and the angels and the star and later the magi coming and the jealous king that was trying to hunt him down, his birth might have seemed like any other birth. It would be 30 years before any declaration was made to confirm who exactly was living under Mary and Joseph's roof. I believe they, they probably knew what was happening, but those in Nazareth probably had no idea that there was a king living amongst them. And when at last Jesus begins to reveal who he really is to the masses, he was killed like a common criminal upon a crossbeam and his mother watched in horror. Mary would at that moment, and probably in thousands of moments before, taste that bitter sting of what Simeon had spoke to her just after Jesus was born. When he said in Luke 2, 25 through 35, a sword will pierce your own soul too, Mary. What I'm really getting at here is we don't really get to see the privilege and wonder in Mary's life because we don't see Jesus for who he really is. And seeing Jesus rightly is everything because he is everything. The truth is that he makes it really easy. He's not trying to hide himself from us. God came near and he draws us near to him even today so that we might know him and love him with all of our hearts. Even though we weren't alive in the generation of this first advent, Jesus left witnesses and written accounts of his life and his message. And then to seal our hearts, he leaves us not as orphans, but he sends his spirit to dwell among us and in us, reminding us that all he said and did is true, teaching us and leading us into the truth about the glory of our God. I love the fact that he sent his son. And I love the fact that there's this question out there of who he was as a child. But the important thing is we know him as the God-man, the child that came to re redeem us and to forgive us of our sins. So as we continue to sing this morning, think about how he entered into this earth. Think about the life that he led, the perfect life that he led, and how that brings us to a celebration of Christmas. child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping whom angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch our keeping this this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him on, the babe, the son of Mary. So bring him in his
Father, you came as a little baby. You came and you glorified your Father by living a perfect, sinless life. And Lord, as you entered into your ministry, you told us of a hope and a peace and a joy that we can find in a life with you. Father, thank you for coming. Thank you for living this perfect life. Thank you for dying on that cross and for redeeming our hearts to your Father. God, open our hearts now. Let us hear. Let us be drawn closer let us become the people that you've called us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. My name is Elena Ray, and I've been attending Hope for my whole life now. Um, recently, I've been attending a worship school called Sons and Daughters, and I've been learning a lot about how to set my roots in God and to not let the changes of the world affect my contentness in Him. Um, and so we have a main phrase that we say, and the phrase is that the world cannot take away your joy because your joy doesn't come from the world. Your joy comes from God. And if we place our joy in things like worldly things that are going to change, we're never going to be content because they are not stable. But if we place our, place our joy in God, we are going to be infinitely more content and just be a generally happy person because we are in something stable because um, God is forever. Um, and so that is what joy means to me. But it is wonderful to have you here with us today, and uh, as we've been just talking about joy and singing about joy, that really is the context of the message that we're going to talk about today. But as we lead into that, I want to take you into just an overview of our year-end project uh, that we are going through during the month of December. Our focus is fully on spiritual leadership development. There is an insert in your bulletin today. Um, if you are watching us online, there's information in our app about it that we'd love to have you follow along with. You know, each year we make a, we make a, a, a plea to our congregation uh, to join us in something that we believe God is asking us to do. And this year, it is something uh, outside of us. It's something that really invests in this generation that is coming up the generation that many of you pray for, uh, you, you uh, support in so many other ways. But each year we, we designate a time 
during the month of December to, uh, to, to pour into these different, married, uh, different areas of ministry. Uh, this year, we're choosing to uh, look at kids and student summer camps in a different way than we have looked at historically. Uh, we see this need ever-growing, and this year, as we went through the budget process, we realized that the need that was before us to fully invest in these students and these children was far greater than what we were able to be able to budget. And so we wanted to come to you and give you that opportunity to invest in the lives of our kids and our students so that they can have this meaningful experience, this encounter with Christ. Uh, many of us have had these experiences where we can talk about kids camp or we can talk about uh, youth camp where we had this life-altering uh, conversation with God and uh, his Holy Spirit led us into something different. And our, our, our uh, goal, our prayer is, is that individuals would come to know Christ, but also the next step of a call to either full-time vocational ministry or ministry in the marketplace and uh, the value of that. The other area that we're, we're talking about is this area of internships and residencies and uh, we have historically had interns that have helped us for just a few weeks, up to 12 weeks during the summer. We're looking to expand that and really invest in those who are, are called into vocational ministry, giving them a good start of a, of a year or more in uh, ministry initiatives and, and coming alongside of our staff so we can pour into them and help prepare them. Many of us know that uh, if we have kids that are st our students yet or college students, we know that, that there's still investment that needs to be made in their lives. And the same is true. Um, you know, I couldn't imagine. I started in full-time vocational ministry at the age of 22, leading a church. I couldn't imagine coming into the complex world that we have today without having extra input and a time where others can pour into me. And this is what we're opening up the opportunity for this to happen through our local church here. The other area is international leadership development, and it's really along the lines of helping individuals prepare to minister in the marketplace in the country of Haiti. What is so true in the country of Haiti is there is a vacuum of good, solid, sound, spiritual leadership. And we want to be a part of investing into the generation that is coming so they could be leaders in a nation that continues to struggle with a vacuum of leadership. And we see that all the way through the news. And so we have a way that uh, we are able to connect with individuals on this. And so our goal this year is $70,000. It's a huge ask. We know that. But we also know that God is calling us to big things. And with big things, he asks us to stretch. And so we're asking you to come alongside of us to pray. What is God asking you to stretch in, in this season where you are investing in those who are coming intentionally. Maybe I, I would encourage you to pray about it, maybe as a couple to pray about it, maybe as a family to pray about it. And what, what is God asking you to stretch in this year in order to help the next generation, specifically in these three areas that we're, we're talking about today? Uh, if uh, when you're ready to make that gift, we encourage you to just write the year-end project on your gift. You can give through the mobile app. There is a drop-down in the mobile app for you to be able to do that as well. And so we, we would just love to have you be a part of what God is doing through hope and the ministries that we have here. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you. We thank you that you give us the opportunity to be able to invest in those that come behind us. And so, Father, today we specifically ask that, that as you, you are the one that has invested in us, you have invested your very life and your blood for our salvation. We pray that as we, as we look forward to investing in others, as we look at investing in others through joy, and the joy that bubbles up from us because of this relationship we have with you, we pray that you would do exceedingly abundantly in our midst today as we open your word and we see what you have for us. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen.
Merry Christmas. Can you really believe it? Like this week, we're going to enter into the Christmas fully, and by the end of this week, we're going to, we're going to celebrate Christmas. And we just want to encourage you that, that if you don't have plans on Christmas Eve, we'd love to have you uh, be here at our main campus at 3, 5, or 7. Or if you want to go check out our north campus at 5 and 7, uh, we're going to be doing services there as well. And so we have five Christmas Eve services this year. And we believe that God is going to meet us in, uh, during, those, during that time together as we celebrate the newborn king. And so we want to encourage you, if there is somebody in your family, if there's somebody in your sphere of influence, this is a great time to ask them. It's, it's really a simple ask. Will you just join me for one of the Christmas Eve services? And we'd love to have you here. Uh, we've been planning this all week, uh, the, over the last several weeks, and uh, we'd love to have you and your family and others join us. Well, we are so thankful that you're here today. If you are joining us online or if you are joining us in the Family Life Center or our gym, we are so thankful that you're with us. If you're at North Campus today, we just want to give a shout out to you. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing here as we are one church meeting in multiple locations. Maybe you're online today and uh, you're at home and you're watching us we so thankful, we're so thankful that you have joined us today for this time together. Today, we are going to kind of wrap up this series that we've been in called A Simple Christmas. And uh, in this simple Christmas, we're talking about things such as hope and love. And today, we're going to talk about the whole idea of joy the whole idea of joy. And so we're going to go to Luke's account of the message that came out about Jesus' first advent into this world. And, and you can just follow along with me, Luke chapter 2, verse 8 and following where we read, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause, what? Let's say it together. Great joy. Let's say it like we mean it. Great joy for all the people. That great joy includes you and me. For all people includes us. Even here in 2021, it includes us. And so joy is what God gives us in the form of a child, a child who grows up and one day lays down his life for us so that we may have life eternal. He goes on and he says, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. So where did we ever get this idea that God is inactive? That God is somehow far and distant and, and removed from our world. That he's boring and he's detached and he's distant from anything that we encounter in this world. Because this tells us something completely different than, than that idea that he is distant and uninvolved. He brings good news of great joy in the person of his son, Jesus and the whole goal was so that you and I could have a relationship with him. God, our Heavenly Father, loves us with great joy. And it's through this great joy he invites us in. And he longs to bring this deeper relationship of joy into our life so that we can not only contain it, but we can spill it out onto others around us. The Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians modeled this kind of life. The kind of life that, that was talked about here, the message of great joy that will be for all the people. But before we turn into the book of Philippians today, which we're going to spend a bulk of our time looking through just the whole book of Philippians. So this is the, a message on the whole book of Philippians in an hour and a half or less. Some of you are going, or less, right? Oh, okay. And so last week we talked about simple love. And we discovered that God's simple love is not so simple, is it? It's hard. It causes us to, to have to forgive others. It calls us, calls the best out in us. We discovered also that God's simple is significant, it's hard, and it's radical. 
It's radical because it's so different than what we would call, call it to be or would want it to be. We used this statement last week as a lens through which we looked at God's plan for salvation. That he came to forgive the lost. That he came to forgive us of great, great sin. And then he said we must forgive as well. We must extend mercy as well. This same concept is is true when it comes to simple joy. You know, I think if Paul could show up today and he could take the stage and he could, he could spend some time talking to us about joy, I believe that Paul would somehow say it like this. Simple joy is being content without becoming complacent. It's being content without becoming complacent. In fact, why don't we just say this out loud together? Simple joy is being content without becoming complacent. Some of you aren't awake yet, so let's try it again. Simple joy is being content without becoming complacent. It's being content without becoming complacent. And so what I want to do is I want to unpack just a little bit more of what Paul is talking about here. He says, he, he, he says in the whole book of Philippians, he says it this way, if we were to boil it down. Being content, simple joy is being content in what you have, and the secret is gratitude. It's having gratitude, being grateful for what we have. It's being grateful, content with what we have without being complacent in who we are. Without being complacent in who you are. And the secret is in growing. The secret is in growing. It's in growing in this relationship with Christ. It's choosing to obey. It's choosing to pursue maturity in this relationship with God. Choosing to go to the next level. Choosing to continue to to put on us and and develop within us the fruits of the Spirit that are given, allowing those to grow and nurturing those. I believe Paul would tell us that the secret to having a real, authentic, simple joy is by a life a life changing joy is choosing to be grateful while growing and not becoming not becoming complacent. And yet, there's a real danger for all of us. I've seen these, this to be true in my life. There's a danger to become complacent in where we are. So, well, I've got to be, I just need to be joyful, and so I don't need to be seeking out all these other things. I need to have a, a heart of gratitude, but yet we don't pursue the greater things. And this is what Paul talks about in the book of Philippians. We just kind of stall spiritually and we don't persevere in our faith and we quit expecting more of ourselves and we just kind of keep status quo. And instead of choosing to change what we can change, we just begin to look for other reasons why we may not have joy in our life. Do you know that part of the key to joy in our life is pursuing a deeper relationship with Christ? It's being deeper in our relationship with Christ today than we were yesterday or a year ago. It's choosing to pursue that. And so what ends up happening is when we're not pursuing that, we begin to blame others and we begin to blame other things for our lack of joy. We say, well, if I just had this or if I just had that, then I would have joy. And the real reason we we come across and say the real reason I don't have joy is because of what they're doing to me. Or what they're not doing for me. And so we kind of get caught into this whole aspect of joy as being conditional. Conditional on what's happening or what I have or what I don't have. The real danger is we all, we all are at risk of being complacent in our faith. And being discontent with what we have. Isn't that true? Paul goes on and he models a different way for us in the book of Philippians. And so as you're turning to the book of Philippians, here's what we need to know. Paul teaches us how to be content with everything 
without becoming complacent. He teaches us how to be content without becoming complacent. He also talks about a joy that is not, that is not dependent on circumstances or what we have or what we don't have. So Paul, the story, the back story, he's writing this letter uh, in chains, uh, in prison. He's writing it to a church in Philippi. At the time, this church is experiencing extreme poverty. They're under persecution. And Paul mentions the word joy several times in the context of this letter. And here's just a few examples. You can underline them or you can circle them uh, as we go through. Philippians 1.3, I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Chapter 2, verse 17, but even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and the service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. He continues this theme of joy or rejoicing in verse 18. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. He continues on in chapter 3, verse 1. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for all of you. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, You whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Chapter 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice. All the way through this letter, Paul uses this word joy or rejoice, and he uses it in context with those who are are the the givers of the gifts, but he's also calling them to rejoice and to have joy because of this relationship that we have with our Father in heaven. He's rejoicing because they sent this this offering to him that was going to help him as he in turn served others. So it wasn't something that just took care of him. He was in turn giving it and serving others. And what makes it even more powerful is they themselves were in need. And so they weren't giving out of their excess, they were giving out of their need. They were expressing their gratitude out of what they had. Look at verse 11. 10 and 11, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that you last renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned but had no opportunity to show it. So we have this joy continuing to move forward. Paul says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Now, wouldn't it be true for most of us that we would say we are content because of our circumstances? It is because of our circumstances that we have found contentment. Um, Or we believe that if our circumstances would change or would alter, we would have joy and contentment and we would be grateful Paul says, I've learned something. It's this simple joy. It's this God-infused joy, this life-changing joy that is not dependent on anything, on anything in our circumstances. Verse 11, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. He goes on in verse 12, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Can I, I, I have this last verse highlighted because, you know, this is probably the most misquoted, out-of-context verse that we see all over the place. Many times people quote this verse, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And often it gets misquoted because, because we take it out of context. We see the context is having contentment, having joy. 
If you look at the context, Paul says, here's what I'm talking about. I'm I'm being content in all circumstances. And how can I be content in all circumstances? Through him, by him who gives me strength. Paul is saying that there is this joy, there is this contentment, there is this strength that comes when you step into a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ. When the Holy Spirit comes and lives and dwells within us, we have joy, we have the ability to have joy and have contentment no matter what the circumstances are. Just before Paul says, I can do all things or all this through him, he recounts several different circumstances that he's found himself in. Whether I'm hungry, whether I'm well fed, whether I've been in need, whether I've had plenty, he's learned to be content no matter what the circumstances He's not contrasting these circumstances to suggest that one is better than the other. He's just helping us to identify with what he's talking about here. He's using the extremes to highlight that he understands human experience. He's been in all camps. He understands all the different variables of life. He isn't, telling, he isn't a rich person telling a poor person to be happy with what they have or vice versa. He's not saying vice versa. And he's not just sitting there with a full stomach telling those who are hungry to just get over it. He says, I can identify with all of you. I've been in in want. I've been with plenty. I've been in all circumstances. And no matter what the circumstances are, he tells us and he teaches us, he leads us into understanding that we can be content no matter what the circumstances. Why? Because everything that Christ has called me to, he strengthens us in. Whether that's in plenty or in what. How does Paul do it? How, did, how does he underscore it? He's tested it. He's been in every situation. And that's where verse 13 comes in. He has learned to be content. He's learned to be grateful no matter what the circumstances. Why? Because Christ's power in him, Christ's strength in him allows that to happen. And so let's just talk a little bit about some some characteristics of a grateful person. A grateful person tends to compare less. They tend to compare less. The moment you take what you have and you start comparing it with others, with what you don't have, and you say, well, this, I don't have this, but they have that, it conjures up within us, it stirs with, up within us this wanting for more. And this is a perfect season for that, right? I mean, we get our list together. You know, pretty soon what ends up happening, we start calling our wants needs, like, I don't want this, I need this. I need to have this. And if we're not careful, those needs become the director of our soul. And and those needs, whether they're met or they're unmet, begins to fashion joy in our heart or lack of joy in our heart. And what ends up happening quickly is it moves to this joy that dissipates and it just escapes because we don't have it anymore. Wouldn't you agree that all the advertising systems that are out today, I've just kind of been watching a little more commercials just in prepping for, for this time. I usually don't like watching commercials at all. But every single commercial is, is bringing this idea to make us discontent with what we already have. And, you know, your life would just be more complete if you had this or you had that or... They say, you need this car, you need this house, you need these clothes, you need this income, you need this to be happy and content. It's designed to make us want stuff. And we believe stuff will make us content. It will cause joyfulness. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says it's an ever-increasing craving from an ever-diminishing pleasure. Let me say that again. It's an ever-increasing craving from an ever-diminishing pleasure. We just, it just causes us to want more. 
and to want more because we never, ever can fill the void. And the world tells us we're just one more purchase away from joy. Just one more purchase. One more thing away from joy. But the problem is, once we have that thing that's supposed to bring us ultimate joy and true joy that the world says that we need, we quickly go and we make another list. Like, oh, this will, this will fulfill my, my needs. This will, this will fulfill the joy that is lacking. This is what I must have. This will completely change my life. When was the last time you opened that gift that you said would completely change your life? It's probably sitting someplace, gathering dust, or you've already sold it or given it away. We convince ourselves that we're just one more purchase away from joy, one more item, one more thing. And Paul says, I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstances, whether in plenty or in want. And he would tell us, listen, learn to be content don't compare everything that someone else has to what you don't have. Be content in what you already have because comparing will lead to discontentment. And if we get into that comparison trap, we'll never be content. Paul says, here's how we are content. And so really, simple joy, it's not simple, right? Because we look at what others have and we want what they have. It's just human nature. It's, it's, it's radical. It's hard because we have to deny ourselves from that want or those needs, you know, because wants become needs very quickly. The other thing that's true about grateful people is grateful people tend to enjoy more. They tend to enjoy more. You know, once we break the comparison game, we are free to enjoy more of what we already have. Once we quit comparing to others and say, well, you know, I wish I had that toy, I wish I had this, or I wish I had that, you know, Joe has it down the street, I ought to have it too. Once we break ourselves of that, we will find true contentment and be grateful. Paul wrote these words of encouragement and instruction to a young man named Timothy. And he tells him, here's how you pursue this. You pursue godliness. Let me read it from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 and following. Paul writes, Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we take nothing with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let's be content. If we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. He goes on down in verse 17 of chapter 6. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Did you catch that last statement? Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. So what is Paul saying? He says God is the ultimate gift giver. He's the ultimate giver of joy and contentment in our life. Great people enjoy what God has given them because he gives it richly to us. He lavishes his gifts on us. And that's because, you know, things don't produce enjoyment. They don't produce joy. Once we have Christ, Paul says, we have everything we need for fulfillment and joy, which then leads to gratitude. Can I tell you that God even gives us stuff? How many of us believe that? He gives us stuff. Like sometimes we just want stuff, but he just gives us stuff. Because he knows that that will help produce joy within us. But the joy that he produces comes from this wellspring within. The other thing that's true about grateful people is they tend to give more thanks. 
Paul writes in chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. Grateful people not only give more thanks to God, but they speak words of gratitude and thankfulness to others. They're very intentional in their gratefulness, in their words. Can you just imagine what would happen if, in your marriage if you both learned how to communicate gratitude with one another? Words of gratitude? Words are powerful. Words come from God our Father. Words of gratitude are powerful in any situation. Can you just imagine the power of the you have as a person before you run out of the room today and you, and you run to your car and you take off because you have a busy schedule in front of you? Can you just imagine the power you have in words to share encouragement with somebody else? What if you were to go today before you left the building And say thank you to somebody who has served you today. Maybe you go to a teacher and you say thank you for preparing and and being here today and leading me today. Maybe you thank a person who served by by taking care of kids so that you could be in a service and and, and so your kids could be taken care of well and taught on their level. What if you were to say, hey, by the way, thank you for what you're doing for our family. Thanks for pouring into my kids. Thank you for allowing me the space to be in here and to listen to your word and to be taught your word and to to worship without that distraction. Thank you for making it possible for me and for my kids to grow. You see the power in that? It's a grateful spirit thanking someone else with a heart of gratitude. Can you just imagine a church stumbling all over one another saying the words, thank you. I mean, it would be contagious. You know, thank you, thank you. And and it's just not using the words. It comes from a heart of gratitude. Like, thank you for what you're doing. Gratitude is a powerful thing. It's contagious. It's another reason that we opened up over this, this month these cards You know, of of simple kindness cards, we have them available at all the exits. You can take them either this way, singles, or, or, you know, if you want to be extra generous and with gratitude, you can take a whole whole section and cut them yourself and, and just use them by buying a meal, buying a coffee, taking care of somebody. It's a simple act of kindness. And then let us know about it. Let us know about how God is using you or how God prompted you through gratitude, the gratitude of what he has given you, and you've displayed it to others. Lastly, grateful people tend to add joy to others. They tend to add joy to others. Jesus, in John chapter 15, says it this way, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my, let's say it out loud, Joy. Let's act like we we mean it, okay? Filled with my... Joy. All right. Say it a little more joyful this time. Filled with my... Joy. joy. Okay. Yes, your joy will overflow. You see how this works? Filled with his joy so that his joy would overflow into others. We are filled so that we can fill others. I like to say it this way. We are filled so we can spill out all over others in a joyful way, with gratitude. Jesus added joy to his disciples so they, in turn, could add joy to others. Jesus reminds his disciples and those of us who have received him as Lord that as we make him Lord of our life, there is a deposit of the Holy Spirit who produces the fruit of the Spirit within us. One of those is joy. The Holy Spirit is what flows out from us to others. Joy, His peace. He wants to give that to us so that we can be complete. 
So how do we begin to live with this simple joy? We already read it in verse 12 of chapter 3 of Philippians. Let me share it with us again. Not that I have already obtained this or have already arrived at my goal, Paul writes, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken a hold of it, but one thing I do, he writes, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. What is he doing? He's leaning in. He's leaning forward. He's got momentum. He says, I'm pursuing the one who saved me. I'm moving forward by forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So he's not only pursuing gratitude, but what else is he pursuing? He's pursuing spiritual growth. He's not content in where he's at but he's pressing forward. And there's this reciprocal thing that happens as we pursue more of him. He fills us with more joy and more gratitude. Paul says, I'm chasing after God. What are you chasing after this Christmas? What are you chasing after in this season What does Christmas mean to you? Is it about stuff? Is it about more stuff? Or is it about the true gift? His gift to us. What are you thankful for? What are you giving to others? What is it that God is encouraging you to do? Maybe to think outside yourself. Because when we think outside ourselves and we lavish joy and love and kindness on others, we reflect our Savior. How are we reflecting our Savior in this season? Will you pray with me? Father God, I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity we have to come before you in these moments and and to thank you for what you have already done for us. I thank you, Lord, for the gift that you gave us in your Son, Jesus. I thank you that you gave us everything. You held back nothing from us. And so in this season, Father, if we have not made you Lord of our life, may that be our very first step. Lord, if we have made you the Lord of our life, may we learn this contentment and this joy that Paul talks about. May our hearts be filled with it in this season. May it spill out to others around us. It's with these things we ask in your name. Amen. Nothing can
Thank you for the joy that you place in our hearts that you allow us to praise you through song. God, as we leave this week, help us to go with anticipation and joy in our hearts, ready to come back and praise on Christmas Eve, to glorify your name, to be in anticipatory waiting of the gift of life through your son, Jesus Christ. God, put joy in our hearts. Let it rest upon our face so that others can see our joy in you. God, we give you glory, we give you honor, and all God's people say, amen. We'll see you next week. Thanks for being here.